So the bottom line is to start with values. What do I value in life? Then put your goals together and make sure your goals match up with your values so that you don't leave anything out. Goals tend to be measurable, but values, honesty, family, love, friendship, you you can't put a number on it. And so we tend to forget about that. Welcome to the Bro Novo Podcast, the podcast that models healthy communication for men, empowering them to start the journey of self-work. Now here's your host, Thomas Pierce. Welcome, friends. This week, my guest is Dr. Christian Heim. Dr. Heim is an award-winning psychiatrist from Australia who is also a former professional classical musician. He still lectures in both medicine and music. How cool is that? Today we discuss Dr. Heim's book, Five Steps to Men's Mental Health, which is a preventative and action-oriented book for any man to get control of their mental health and prevent serious depression, anxiety, addiction, and suicide. Dr. Heim is an incredibly intelligent person, and also his motivations are truly to help people. Even this deep 20 years into his career, that's really his motivation, which actually came through in the three things game at the end, which was quite interesting. So thank you to Dr. Heim for being our guest this week and enjoy the show. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon, doctor. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks, Thomas. How are you? Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you. Um, when I was reading your, your book, I was really impressed. I could just tell, one, how intelligent you are. You know, it's hard to convey complicated ideas in a concise way, but you were able to do that with, with your work that I read. So yeah, I'm excited and thank you for, for being here. No, look, that's, that's all right. Thanks for that. But uh, my aim is for people to understand what's going on. And sometimes it does get really complex. So that is something that I do want to do. I do want people to be able to understand what's going on. Thanks for that. Yeah, of course. It's a genuine, <laughs> genuine compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so you are a, a psychiatrist. And you're based in, in Australia, but you have yeah. international engagements and work around the world. Um, could you provide the audience just a little bit of your background to start off with, please? Uh, well, I actually started off as a classical musician. And I had a career in classical music, and I was lecturing at a university. And um, you know what? I wasn't going to save the world through music. And I really had a passion to help people. So I actually went back to university. I, I, I got my medical degree, became a doctor, um, started working in different fields. But I just had a heart for the people in psychiatry. Um, it's, it's a really difficult area. And it's something that more and more, it, it affects all of us because all of us are trying to figure out how to get through this thing called life. And it, it's actually not easy. And as it's turned out in the last 20 years, we've actually had an explosion of mental health issues, so much so that the World Health Organization is calling it an ap- epidemic. And as you know, uh, suicide rates are much higher in men uh, than, than in females. And uh, that's a particular problem. So I suppose that that's why I wrote this particular book, so that people could uh, get to the stage where they could work on a few things without having to see somebody like me. Totally, totally. Yeah. And, you know, to, to frame the book too, you, you just lay out the statistics around depression, anxiety, and how common it is. Yeah. And you attribute a lot of the current state and how common it is to our environment. So I do kind of, you know, genetically, we were evolved to stressful situations, pumped extra sugar into our bloodstream. Because from an evolutionary perspective, if we were in a fight or flight mode, it was because we had to go get food because we were starving or fight off a predator or something like that. But yeah. nowadays, it's because we're, we're sedentary and we're, you know, work is giving us the stress. Yes. And I found that really interesting. And the other thing, man, that, that strikes me, doctor, is just that I think similar to climate change almost, this epidemic has been acknowledged, but there's no urgency around fixing it. In our culture. Yeah, it is. It is very difficult. And one of, one of the reasons is that we're very comfortable in our culture. There are a lot of things that uh, that is in our modern lives that we don't want to change. 
uh, we don't want to give up all the prosperity. We don't want to give up all the prolonged health. And that's fine. We shouldn't. We don't want to give up the internet. We know that the internet has some problems. But Thomas, without the internet, we couldn't do what we're doing right now. Okay. So we have to learn how to handle these things. And you're right. We still have predators. Our predators are deadlines. Our predators are fear of failure. Our predators are unemployment for a lot of people. And our predators are also quick fixes, things like addictions that can kind of get us through. But all of these things have to do with the environment, not with the actual person. And that's what's changed. Because as I say in the book, our genetic makeup hasn't changed terribly much in 60,000 years. So why would we all of a sudden in the last couple of decades have a depression, anxiety and addictions crisis? It has to do with the environment. For sure. And maybe we could go into those three things because at the start of, of five steps to men's mental health, you lay out really simple action plans for each of those yeah. topics. Yeah. 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 Because um, look, when you start a, a, a book, you know, um, we can go through a whole lot of knowledge and a whole lot of theory, but the real reason that somebody's reading a book is to get some answers, get some ideas as to, well, what, what can I do about this? So straight away, I mean, I, I start off talking with depression and, uh, yeah, we've, we've heard the stats, they're bad. Uh, we've, we've heard everything that contributes to it, but what can we actually do? So in the very first chapter, I give, um, hints that people can do sort of straight away. And we have so many studies showing us that if you exercise, your mood will improve, right? So if, if you're depressed, it's somehow to get moving. And so I, I talk about, um, how good it is to do something that makes you move. And motivation is not an easy thing, but if you want to get well, to be able to use that as motivation to start exercising. So for each of the things like depression, anxiety, addictions, and suicide, I go straight into what you can do about it straight away. And of course, it's it's not going to be there's, there's one fix that's going to save everybody, but it's just a start because we've got to make that start. Uh, we've all got lives to lead. For sure. The one about addiction and delayed gratification, I found, yeah. I found really good. Yeah. And I mean, our phones, right? Our, and that's the other thing that I, I find incre incredible about our modern society is that I feel like everyone's acknowledged the pitfalls of smartphones and how it's just dumping our brains with these chemicals and throwing our brains off, but yeah, we're not taking steps to change it also. It's like, I don't know. It's it's interesting. And, and so that was the one that I, I found really interesting about, yeah, just because simple things to do. So... For me, I've recently uh, gotten rid of my personal Instagram account. I have Hold one for, for, thank you. Yeah, I have one for the podcast, and yeah. it's 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 funny because now there's less distraction, so I have to actually sit with my feelings and. <laughs> and... <laughs> but it's yeah. good. Yeah, it it's necessary. Good. It is good, but you've articulated one reason why we gravitate to our phones so much. Because uh, most all of us, okay, but men in particular, young men have complex emotions running around in their head and it feels awful. So if you get onto a phone or if you get onto a website, those feelings will just sort of fade off into the background and that's instant gratification. That's taking away a pain. So to delay gratification in a very um, practical way is to say, right, for the first hour after I get out of bed, I'm just not turning on the internet or my phone at all. Now, that's just an hour of delayed gratification. But if that can become a habit, and then you make that two hours, if you possibly can, some of us have to work on the internet, right? But it's all that entertainment and the interesting stuff that we all get into. The more that you can just take that out of your day, the more that you will have to sit with your feelings. But here's the thing. Your brain will find a way through the feelings because it's okay to be you. It's okay to be a male. It's okay to have bad feelings. But we need to be able to find a way through them to be able to channel them and move forward. Certainly. And have you had any observations on young men in particular that kind of differentiate from older men? So my guess would be that young men are probably a bit more volatile, uh, yeah. maybe a bit more rash 
Is, yeah. Have you found that to be true in your patients? Yeah. Yes, I have. I have. There are actually a lot of differences between young men and older men. However, there are a lot of similarities as well. Anger has just always been a special emotion for men, right? Because, <laughs> yeah, because let, let's face it, Thomas, we all want to change the world, all right? We all actually want to get out there and make it a better place to, to, to make some sort of a difference. And if we can't do that, if we're not allowed to do that, we get frustrated and this can get us really angry. Uh, but a couple of differences between older men and younger men. Um, older men grew up in a time when they didn't have the internet, which means that uh, they're used to, let's say, sitting with feelings or going outside of themselves to do stuff, right? Uh, so even just going for a walk, going for a bike ride, going for a jog, all that sort of stuff. I know that younger men do this as well, all right, but not to the extent You've always got a screen kind of calling out your name, saying, come here. And so that becomes part of the brain's hard wiring. And that's really difficult. And the other, the other difficult thing uh, is it's like there's a message coming to younger men that there's something wrong with being a male. And, Thomas, there isn't. There isn't. According to evolutionary principles, we became male and female out of survival needs to propagate our species for the good of us all. That means it's actually good to be a male just as it's good to be a female and everything else in between, all right? So we're not excluding <laughs> anything. We're not excluding anything, but we're saying sort of whoever you are, that's okay. But there's this feeling that it's not okay to be competitive. It's not okay to have aggressive drives. And the thing is that when a um, young male finds out that they do have aggressive drives, they think, oh, no, there's something wrong with this, rather than saying, okay, how am I going to channel this usefully? What can I point myself into that will have a good outcome? Certainly. The, the piece you said about managing anxiety and finding an outlet through sport or sports, as it's known, in the U.S. resonated with me because I'm a rugby player and I still play rugby. Right. And it's great, totally, because I can go and absolutely try to hurt people. And then <laughs> afterwards, I'm, <laughs> I'm very calm and it's all it's okay. And that's something else that just about American culture, maybe it's the same in Oz, you'll have to tell me, but, you know, kids are, are, are you know, told to be sports obsessed. And if you don't play sports and you're a kid, then you're outcast. But then... Yeah. When we grow up as adults, no one plays sports anymore. It's just yeah. a lost art. And I, I've always thought that that is silly because it's community. It's a chance to recreate. It's a chance to stay physically fit and keep our brains active. And I, yeah, I don't know what or why this is a thing in our culture, but that has always confused me. And it was really validating actually to read that in your book and be like, yes. <laughs> oh, sports is just amazing. And I look, yeah. I, I grew up in a community where, uh, yeah, we got together on the weekends and we just played sports, just dumb games, and old people would be playing with children and everybody in between. Uh, and uh, it's it's not that we stopped doing this, but we stopped having the opportunities of doing this. Community opportunities are really difficult to come by these days. People just don't get together for church activities, for sporting activities, for volunteer activities, just because you happen to have a whole lot of friends activities. You know, before we had uh, the internet and all this travel that we do, uh, we used to just get together with people on a Saturday afternoon in our small town because they're the only entertainment that we had. So what would you do? You'd organize <laughs> a game of some sort, okay? You can't talk forever, so you just have a game and you just enjoy yourself, all right? And look, I, I don't want to say that the old times were the good times because that's actually not true. We live in the most amazing society right now, but it has a few side effects. And one of the side effects of being amazingly connected as we are at the moment is less physical connection with the people around us, right? Like I'm, I'm talking to you, right? But uh, a, a neighbor two doors down, um, I haven't spoken to for years and years. That's actually very strange. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. We can walk down the street and, you know, maybe I'll be texting or talking to my family in Philadelphia and there's a right. person five feet away from me that I barely notice. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 
That's right. <laughs> that's, that's a side effect. We didn't go out to do that, but that's just a side effect of what mm-hmm. happened with the internet. Yeah, and I found I found as well that being someone who can take the risk of trying to make those interpersonal connections in the physical environment yeah. has generally positive feedback from other people because yeah. some people get freaked out and they're not ready for it and they're like, don't talk to me. But other people are like, wow, like you're a real person and you're talking to me. This is so yeah. enriching and so different. And yeah, I've just as a personal anecdote, um, I found out that, you know, if you can if when I can push through that hesitancy, I can really make some good genuine connections. Yeah. The the other thing that I found really interesting was this concept of uh serenity yeah. as a way to combat depression particularly. Yeah. Could could you explain that that concept? Uh yeah, yeah. I'll I'll actually segue into that from something that you were talking about, making connections with people around you. Uh uh my wife and I like going to uh, for walks along the beach and we've had to consciously say, look, if we pass somebody on the beach, we're going to stop and talk as much as they want to. But it's like you've got to make this decision consciously because otherwise uh, we just all pass each other by and uh, we kind of forsake that opportunity. And so the thing is that all the things that we used to take for granted, we've now got to make a decision to do. So just like you stopping to talk to somebody who's five feet away from you, it's a decision that's got to be made. Now, what I'm doing is I'm segueing into my way of finding serenity. And my way of finding serenity is to walk a lonely beach, um, to have a swim in the water, okay, uh, a little bit of body surfing, no, uh, not terribly much, you know. But the thing is that there's the expanse of water, there's the expanse of sky and the expanse of sand, which just seems to absorb all of my attention. And whatever does it for you or for anybody else, and it can be a sport, it can be going to a sporting fixture, it can be reading, it can be listening to music, uh, it can be absolutely anything, it can be meditation. Right, but meditation is not for everybody. A lot of people try and go, you know what, this just isn't happening for me. <laughs> but whatever it is, find what resonates with you to say, this is space where I am just alone with the whole universe, so that the environment that's been giving me stress all day long just dissipates, dissipates, and you drill down to who you are as a person because you exist, you're a person, you're here. And you're alive. And that is wonderful. It is wonderful. It's life is a beautiful gift. And so, so often it's hard for us to see that. And you give a lot of anecdotes, anecdotes and the stories of with well, identities changed, of course, but the general tenets of yeah. some patients you've worked with. Yeah. And one that really struck me as a good thing for the audience to hear as a, as a warning is, the business person, the businessman who prioritized work and prioritized making money and communicated to his wife and his family that they were second in line. Yeah. And then he finds himself alone. So you've probably seen that, you know, many times over. And do you have any any kind of advice or better than advice, even a framework for young men kind of approaching the mid career level? as a way to prioritize and a way to make sure how do I balance make being successful and having material comfort, but not getting yep. lost in the, you know, consumption race. Yep. 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 No, no, really good Thomas, because uh, a, a lot of us are very goal driven because we want to achieve and if we put goals in place, uh, then we can actually put plans in place to achieve the goals. That's fine. That's wonderful. But the thing is that when we start saying goals, we start thinking about, kudos, fame, uh, material possessions, money, okay, career advancement. So what I encourage people to do is to start off with values. Because if you start off with values, well, what do I actually value in life, right? Then all of a sudden, things like family, honesty, love, friendship, those things are values, but it's hard to make a goal out of any of those. So let's say the guy who... um, Uh, He got his career, but he lost his family. He could have had both. That's the whole thing. 
if you value the people around you first, uh, they will actually help you succeed in your career. Everybody actually wants you to succeed. But if they feel that they have been pushed down your priority list, then they start becoming resentful. So the bottom line is to start with values. What do I value in life? Then put your goals together and make sure your goals match up with your values so that you don't leave anything out. Because we our goals tend to be measurable, but values, honesty, family, love, friendship, you, you can't put a number on it. And so we tend to forget about that. And the things that actually make worth uh, life worthwhile is your values, the people around you. Great. I like that. If I'm if I'm hearing that correctly, it's it's a it's a way of designing one's life so that the goals reflect the values and it's a constant reinforcement loop. Yeah. Yeah. So that you one one can't really be possible without the other because so even if I'm succeeding in business, if I'm not valuing my relationships and my health, then and if I have that consciously as a framework, yeah. then I I'll, it'll be checked. Yeah. 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 So I, another way of looking at it is to plan your life from your deathbed because people on their deathbed never sort of say, you know, I should have made a couple more hundred thousands of dollars. That would have really done it. Okay. On your <laughs> deathbed, it's sort of like, no, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's this is, funny. This is true, okay? <laughs> it, it's sort of like, did I love people? Was I loved by people? Did I share things and have the experiences that I wanted to? Okay. So all of those things have got to come first then, because if you get the money, but you don't get the people or the love, you wonder if that's been a successful life. And, and the thing is that you can actually have it all because we actually want each other to succeed. We're there to help each other. So planning life backwards is not a bad idea either. For sure. Uh, another one, uh, none of us are getting out of this alive. It's kind of a more gallows humor, but also something I find kind of useful to keep a perspective. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one, yeah, yeah. One, one of the tenets uh, of the one of the five steps is to manage strong emotions. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's interesting because men are not told to acknowledge their emotions one right so the, the from that i can infer that men would be struggling to manage even medium to low intensity emotions because we're not really conditioned to acknowledge them or deal with them yeah yeah and but you have here that you know managing strong emotions as as a vital thing to do to to maintain good mental health so could you walk us through that a little bit? And, and how do you define strong emotions too in that in that in this uh, scenario? Okay, so strong emotions. <laughs> I think every man knows them. Okay, the ones where you're afraid I'm going to lose it, right? I'm going to do something that can cause destruction, and we're all capable of that. And uh, just to put um, men not handling emotions into perspective, uh, I'm going to take you to a battlefield in World War Two. Because uh, on a battlefield in World War II, when you have a platoon of soldiers working together, they have to get a job done, and that job means life or death. And so in that moment, you've got to sort of say, okay, I've got strong emotions, but I've got to push them down so I can get a job done, right? You can't listen to your anger. You can't listen to your fear. You've got to find some way of using those to get the job done. And so what happens in that situation, and we're talking about war, men learn to push emotions down to get a job done. Now, unfortunately, we went through a century, the 20th century, that had a lot of wars. So pushing emotions down for men became an expectation because of that warrior side of society's expectations on us. But the thing is, we have had peace relatively, for a long period of time. And what happens then is the um, uh, the techniques that we have to help us through a war situation don't serve us too well because in uh, – <laughs> well, you, you, look what happens. Yeah. yeah, no, well, you end up with um, a group of friends and people anger each other just a little bit, but you don't say anything. You just sort of push that emotion down 
and then it builds and it builds and it festers and it festers until somebody explodes. Somebody loses it, right? Now, that can look different. It, it could uh, end up with two guys in a fist fight, right? That's two guys losing it. Uh, but if we had been able to handle the strong emotions before it got to that stage, you wouldn't have had the fist fight. You would have been able to have words that said, you pissed me off. What do you mean I pissed you off? Well, hey, let's just talk about this. Okay, what was it that I did? And the dialogue means that you can come to an understanding. But to do that, you've got to have words to link the emotions and you've actually got to express it safely. So step by step, I go through that in that particular step, right? That first of all, you've got to look inside, notice the emotion, put a label on it. So you actually need a word for an emotion. And you only actually need about 30 or 40 words for emotions and you can tame the beasts within. There are good emotions in there too, Thomas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Because that, you know, the thing I like about your approach is that it's a framework approach. You know, it's not, yeah. it's not anecdotes or kind of, pie in the sky ideas. It's very tangible things that anyone can use and apply yeah. and, and try at least. Right. Cause yeah. as you acknowledge, you know, there's no, there's no fix it. There's no cure all for everyone, but like with the exercise example, you know, it, even if it doesn't solve your depression or completely eliminate it, it might take it from a, a, a medium to a mild or a, a severe to a, a medium as far as the intensity of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and that brings me to uh, another way that we consume information because um, you said I've got a framework approach because what, I, what I'm encouraging people to do is actually work on whatever it is that they need to work on. But you see, we don't like doing that. And, you, and when you're on the internet, let's say you've got a question like how to ha handle anger. Well, you'll find one article, you'll read it and go, okay, I'll, I'll look at another one. Now I'll look at another one. And you're hoping that you'll get to an article or a video somewhere that's got the answer. And as soon as you've got the answer, you go, great, that's it. That's what I've got to do. But it's actually not like that. The work only starts when you start practicing. Okay, so m maybe any of the articles had an answer for you that would work for you. But here's the problem. You've got to practice it just like you've got to practice ball skills when you're playing football or you've got to practice scales when you're playing piano. Uh, it's got to be practiced so that each day you get just a little bit better at it, which is in a way delaying gratification. It takes a bit of work. Without that work, you're not going to get good at it. So in the book, what I try to do is to say, okay, this is how you work at it, little by little, step by step to get to where you need to be. For sure. How do you get a patient with little to no discipline to be disciplined? Because because that's what I'm hearing is that this is work and work takes discipline. It takes consistency yeah. and it takes a, a mental fortitude to follow through and, and keep, keep trying. So if someone comes to you without that discipline, how, how does one, how do you, you know, go about getting them to that point where they can actually take care of themselves? Okay, so you're talking about developing discipline. Uh, and, okay, firstly, the reason that we are undisciplined is because we have the internet and a whole lot of entertainment media <laughs> saying, look yeah. at me first, look at me, all right? Now, uh, w when I say that, a lot of people go, oh, gosh, that's me, that's me, you know, sort of this is terrible, I, I'm just not disciplined, and they end up condemning themselves and feeling worse about themselves. So the message that I'm giving here is you're not to blame because it's all this environmental stuff that's to blame, but it is your responsibility. So in other words, you can make a decision and all that you have to do is to do a little bit better today than you did yesterday. Okay. So, so let's say I suggested that people do without their iPhone for the first hour in the morning. All right. Uh, now, a lot of people will try that and go, you know what, I just can't do it. Can't do it. Okay, that's fine. Can you do five minutes? Well, yeah, of course I can do five minutes. Okay, I just get out of bed, right? By the time I've 
uh, been in the bathroom and had a shower, you know, that's five minutes there. Good. Do five minutes. A week later, can you do 10 minutes? Well, yeah, yeah, I can do 10 minutes. That's easy. All right. I just have to double what I did the five minutes. That's good. Next week, can you do 15? All right. Now, it'll take you two months, but just doing it that way, <laughs> you build up the skill of doing without your iPhone for an hour. And I know it sounds trivial. And this is, this is what people get really frustrated about. You know, I should be able to do this. But it's all developing skills and making that decision every day. And, and if you stuff up, fine. We all do. Get back on track and just do it again. Okay. So, keep trying. so that's just for delaying. Yeah, yeah, yeah just, just, just keep trying, all right, uh, because it actually isn't easy. And marketing psychologists have gotten into your brain and they know what to do to drag you back to that phone. We are actually all addicted to our iPhones. And that's, that's sad, but it's a reality that it we've is. got to face. Yeah. I, I realized that in just today, actually, I was talking to a friend. And I was like, you know, because by deleting the social media and f having all this new space come up in my life, I realized that. And I was like, wow, yeah, I think we all are actually addicted to this. And it's not it's not something that is acknowledged or taken seriously. Or I guess it is acknowledged, but yeah. it's not taken seriously. Um, so another another one that I see a lot and I'm hey, still in this environment. Actually, Tom, just before you go on that, I, I want to give you a good example of that. Like I, I lecture to a lot of uh, lawyers, okay, and lawyers are always looking to have a bit more time, and they too are addicted to, well, often things like alcohol and cocaine, right, but things like their iPhone and their Facebook accounts, and, um, and I get people saying to me, okay, how can I make more time in my day except by turning off my iPhone because that's not going to happen. So can you find another solution, right? So uh, straight away, people have decided that they just can't do this, all right? There's got to be another way. And sometimes there isn't another way. Sometimes you actually need to face it head on, what we call taking the bull by the horns and saying, no, nah, i got to grapple with this, all right? So um, I, I, I just wanted to say that don't give up. Yeah. Break it down to something really small, but get used to victories. If you can do five minutes, if you can do 10 minutes, you start feeling good about yourself, all right? Anyway, totally. Sorry, Tom. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere else. yeah, yeah. No, that's great. And, you know, I, one time I was doing a, like a calisthenics workout with these yeah. professional calisthenics trainers and – I did one of their workouts as like a fitness test and it was really hard. But by the end I was completely just out on my feet and I had the, like six more pull-ups or whatever to do. And they were like, just take it one at a time. That's exactly so right. I think, yeah, that's the mentality. And I guess the, the thing too, that I've learned from my own endeavors is that you really have to want the end result. Right. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. you need that, that's something to, whether it's the person who doesn't want it, like the, the business person who doesn't want to lose their family or, yeah. you know, the person who lives far away from their family who doesn't want to lose that connection. So makes the time to call or whatever the thing is like that, that end goal has to mean enough to the person to actually motivate them to, to do these little steps. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is that all of us know that we could be living more. We could be enjoying life more. We could just be making the world just a little bit better. And so, okay, so let's go back to your calisthenics uh, of, uh, okay, so you're with a group of people. And if you're with a group of people that are really good at what they do, you're not going to feel too good because you compare yourself with what they're able to do without seeing that they've put years and years and years into effort to get what uh, to where they are. So, one of the pitfalls that we get into is comparing ourselves with other people's achievements, right? And social media lets us do that a lot. And so we start feeling bad about ourselves. But the person to compare yourself to is yourself. Compare yourself to yesterday and say, all right, Christian, what can you do today that means that you're just a little bit better than you were yesterday? Because if you're just improving whatever that means to you, if it's 
doing push-ups, chin-ups, um, keeping in contact with your family, uh, or just finding a bit more serenity in your life, or just doing without your iPhone for a couple more minutes, you'll feel good about yourself, right? So you compare yourself with uh, who you were because you want to reach towards who you could be. And see, that's hard because none of us know what we could actually be, what we could actually uh, achieve if we put our minds to it. But when you start getting the feeling of self-respect, right, that's an, that's an amazing feeling. Hey, I did well and I feel good about myself. There are a lot of people that feel so bad about themselves that they have given up on self-respect. And the way to get self-respect is just to improve a little bit, a little bit every day and make decisions that you respect yourself for. Beautiful. Well said. The Thank power you. of positivity. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But it comes down to what you said that you've got to want what you what you want. Okay, so you've got to want your connection with your family. And, uh, and the trouble is that chemically – we are now getting more dopamine reward from being online than from talking to a member of our family. Whereas before we didn't have the online option. So you talk to your family or you played a game with your family and that was the best that you could get. So that means that we now have to make conscious choices to talk to a family member who you can have a lot of fun with, but sometimes they're going to anger you as well. All right. And that's just part of being human, all right? It's not always going to be a fun time, but it is actually worthwhile because you reach into something deeper. The internet cannot love you back no matter how hard you try. It just can't. Wow. Yeah, that's that's very profound. The other thing that kind of reminded me of some things I do in my life would be for each of these five steps in the book, you ha you have a idea of a new slogan for yeah. each one. Yeah. And and I do that. And especially when I was younger, but today as well, like it's funny you said that this whole thing about every day, because my roommate actually has a whiteboard and he has, you know, a, a thing of be better than you were yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And so my understanding of this uh, is that a little, a little slogan or a little, soundbite to remind yourself of why you're doing these things. So for me and say it's podcasting, maybe it's yeah. before every interview, I'm going to put in 10 extra minutes of preparation in order to make the quality of the conversation that much higher in order to give a better, a better output of the conversation as an example. Yeah. Um, but I like the idea of those slogans because it gives, it gives us that affirmation and that positive self-talk which is kind of awkward. You know, it can, it can be awkward to say, I'm proud of me, yeah. you know, especially as men, right? Cause we're not, we're not told to be boastful or emotional at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's very much true. And, and also with these slogans, um, there's a problem with rah, rah affirmations. Okay. <laughs> every day life is getting better. Yay, every day life is getting better. Every day life is getting better, all right? And sometimes people think if they find something like that, that their life will get better. The problem is that you have to find a slogan that you actually believe. Now, if I try to say myself, um, life is getting better every day, there's a part in my brain that says, garbage, you don't believe that right? Life was better before right. the, the coronavirus crisis, okay? It just was, right? So <laughs> you cannot fool yourself, right? So you've, uh, you've got to find something that you believe. I can be a more loving person or I enjoy sharing information with people. You go, yeah, I'm not disputing that. I do enjoy sharing information with people. So when that becomes your slogan, your brain goes, yeah, yeah, that's true. Can we do more of that? Then you start finding little ways of doing a bit more of that because it feels good. And you're not trying to fool yourself. So you just can't fake it, unfortunately. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I think with all of these self-improvement endeavors, it comes down to a point where the, 
the person really has to want it. And yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a point where you can't, you can't fool yourself and you can't fool anybody else. And I found that interesting too. And and we talked about the addicts you've worked with and that every single person who you worked with, who's overcome an addiction has had that moment where they said to themselves, you know, no more. And we, I had Paul Boggy on my, my pod a while back. He was a heroin addict in Scotland and he described a moment where he woke up one day, went up to the mirror and said, don't ask for any more fucking heroin because you're not going to get it. And that, from that day, he's been clean of heroin. Right. Okay. <laughs> See, that, that's amazing. That's an amazing story. That is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's the power of decision, right? And the trouble is that you can't fake it because he could have made that decision many times before that time, right? And he kind of wanted it, but this time he looked at himself and he said, no, nah. line drawn, we're not going there again. And so his life would have improved. And you start to enjoy that improvement and you go, you know what? I'm not going back to that because it's not easy. So a lot comes down to why are we actually alive, all right? And I, I, I can't say that any of us have got the answer to that, but we will all move through different answers for ourselves, okay? Uh, even if you get to one of the purposes of my life is to find out why I'm alive, all right? So you just sort of keep moving with that because it's an amazing experience. Life is an amazing experience. And today it will just never happen again. So the imperative to not only enjoy today, but to make what you can out of today and be useful becomes very important. Otherwise, it's gone. Totally. So one of the things that we talk about a lot on this program is, you know, what's the the inverse of toxic masculinity? You know, we've, we've identified in the culture pretty clearly – problematic behaviors, but there's not a lot of modeling of, of positive behaviors. So uh, this is, you know, one more just of your personal opinion, perhaps, but yeah, you know, if you were to, you know, create a, a template of, of <laughs> Dr. Himes list of how to be a good man for young people, yeah. you know, what, what are the kind of um, foundational things that you think men should aspire towards being? Okay. Wholesome masculinity. Wholesome masculinity. So a toxin is something that's that's bad for your body, that's poisonous. Something that's nutritious, good food, is wholesome. It makes you more, it makes you better, it makes you feel good to be alive. So wholesome masculinity is channeling the same energies into something useful. So let's take aggression. Uh, We can use our aggression to destroy cars, to destroy people, to hurt a lot of things. But aggression is what's needed in wholesome determination. Whenever men get together and say, you know what, we're going to win this game. We're going to put together the best set of moves on on our opposition that we can. All right. And when you see people like, okay, I'm going to a tennis player, Roger Federer, when it comes to a big point and he is down, love 40, he will serve up three aces. Now, that's wholesome masculinity. Inside, you don't see it, but he musters all his anger because he's pretty pissed off at being down. And he will channel it to be determined to hit that ball as hard as he can and as accurately as he can. So whenever uh, men are given a task like winning a football game, building a bridge, passing an exam, you've got to muster your anger and say, you know what, I'm determined to pass this exam. That means I've got to do two hours of study a day for the next four weeks. So I know the damn stuff so I can show people that I can damn well do it. So that is, there's anger in that, but it is in determination. Right. A lot of t- toxic, uh, toxic masculinity also comes down from um, men misusing their, their sex drive because the energy of sex is very, very strong. And when it's not harnessed, 
then it has just just bad expressions, all right? Okay, which tragic outcomes, yeah. Yeah, tragic outcomes. They are. They're absolutely tragic. Okay. So that energy, if you are in a relationship, you can harness the energy of that to become passionate, loving, caring, affectionate, and physically really excited about who you are with. So it becomes a total experience. It doesn't just become getting your rocks off, okay? It becomes much more, and people feel that. And uh, all that energy becomes sometimes overwhelming, but in a positive way. So it's uh, it's finding also um, uh, a lot of business people, uh, they use their, their sex energy to make the next sale because the essence of sex is desire. And so when you go, you know what? I want to become the top salesman for this week, all right? Not having much sex in my life at the moment, so I'm going to redirect all that energy into the desire of this particular outcome. And I can't say that that works all the time, but it's directing an energy that could be misspent in something really quite catastrophic into something that becomes useful. And that both of those things bring you self-respect. And when, as a man, you're walking in self-respect and you feel capable, that feeling is very good. That feeling is very good. It is. It's it's an incredible feeling. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's it's to leverage the natural gifts we've been given and make yes. sure they have healthy outlets instead of, yes. one, suppressing it, or two, letting yeah. bad influences direct it somewhere You know that hurts everybody. Yes. 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 Awesome. Yes. Awesome. But the but the yeah, but the uh the message is there's nothing wrong with being a male. It is a gift to be a male. Just like it's a gift to be a female, all right? But um uh all those energies are not toxic, they're masculine. So you've got to take the same energies and make them wholesome masculinity rather than toxic masculinity. One of the topics that has come up a lot on here is giving men the permission to interact with their feminine as well? Yes. Is that something that you would agree with as a, as a, as a good thing to not only be in the masculine, but to also do the dance, if you will? Yeah, it's, it's a very good thing. And I talk about this in the book as well, because it was um, a psychiatrist, Carl Jung, that, that basically let us know that um, every female has a masculine side and every male has a feminine side. And so um, creative pursuits, uh, men doing the cooking, men doing the, uh, the uh, nursing, all of these things are getting in contact with our feminine side. And because we have the luxury of peacetime, we're able to do that. And rather than feeling threatened by that, you actually feel your manhood becoming stronger. It actually feels good to get in contact with your feminine side. The thing is, though, that societal attitudes sort of lags behind, all right? And this is where younger generations of men are doing much better than older generations. Older generations still remember when you used to get teased for having a feminine side, whereas now we know that it's actually much more healthy. It's a good thing to bring up, Thomas. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I have – it's not often – I have an MD in front of me. It's usually more of a more, more, I don't, I don't want to say woo woo in a degrading way, but you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I, I thought I would just affirm that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds good. Right. That sounds really, really good. Awesome doctor. Okay. Well, we're going to pivot over to the, the three things game here. So we each get one question and whoever has the, uh, soonest birthday coming up on the calendar goes first. So what month is your birthday in? My <laughs> birthday is in September. September. Okay, yeah. then I'm up because I'm in August. <laughs> All right. Okay, what are we doing? Okay, here's my question. What are three things I have learned about happiness? Okay. Well, I think I learned from this conversation that I can use consciousness to increase my happiness outcome. Yeah. So by kind of using tried and true methods to 
regulate my emotions and apply some structure to my mental health, I can, you know, have a happier outcome. Yeah. Um, I've also learned that it's okay not to be happy. It's not possible for me to be happy all the time. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. And then number three, I'm not responsible for other people's happiness. Yeah. You know, that's something that kind of took me a longer time to learn just yeah. meeting people and, and feeling compelled to try to change other people's moods, I guess, but that's not my, it's not my job. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for that because I haven't got that on board yet. All right. I, I still feel responsible for other people's happiness. All right. So thank you for that. I'm going to, I'm going to take that one on board. All right. I'm awesome. going to work with that one today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's your question. Oh, okay. What are three things that you have learned about anger? Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, firstly, anger is a ubiquitous emotion. So in other words, everybody experiences anger. Um, I have learned that uh, anger is a, um, is a response to injustice. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's the, that to me is the core of what anger is. And um, as a psychiatrist, I've also learned that uh, repressing anger, so in other words, pushing it down and trying to avoid it, uh, only leads to explosions. So uh, the way to work with anger is to be able to get in touch with it and to be able to express it safely so that it's understood and discharged safely. How's that? Is that all right? <laughs> yeah, it's, that's incredible. So to the understood component is interesting to me because it to be un, something to be understood, it has to be acknowledged. So that yes. means that it has to be seen by the individual and others. Yes, yes. So so let me go to the brain for this one, okay? Uh, as okay. a gross generalization, the frontal lobe <laughs> thinks and the limbic system feels, all right? And uh, anger is generated in the amygdala, which is in the limbic system. Now, if we let that do whatever it wants, okay, we will feel less in control. But because we've got a good frontal lobe, if we can link our thinking with our feeling, then we can have a good outcome. And first of it is thinking, oh, I'm angry at the moment. I have to be careful what I say or do right now. What is the best thing for me to do? So that will get you a good outcome, but you won't get there unless you can link your thinking with your feeling right? Uh, because what happens in a lot of angry people is they feel this overwhelm them and then they stop thinking, right? Because they start to freeze inside, which means that the anger takes over. Whereas if you can go think, think, you're angry, think, think, why are you angry? Think, think, think. Okay, good. Plan. What are you going to do? This is what I'm going to do. And then you put in a plan that's safe. You'll get a much better outcome. That's great. That's very useful. Thank you for sharing that. That's I'm going to use that in my own life. Thomas, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we've got Thomas awesome, working Dr. on Heim. anger. We've got Christian working on happiness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Bro Nouveau podcast, changing lives. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, where can, where can the audience find your work and engage with, um, some of these these content and these books you're putting out. Oh, okay. So the, the books are on Amazon, uh, but the easiest place to uh, find the stuff that I'm working on is on our website, which is drchristianheim, all one word, dot com. Uh, we're, we're also on Instagram and LinkedIn, uh, among other places. But if you type in my name, you'll you, you'll find some stuff. Thanks for asking, Thomas. Yeah, of course. Thank you for, for volunteering your time. And it was really interesting. And uh, I'm excited to go listen back to this and take some notes. And uh, thank you for the book, too. No, no I worries. found it very impactful. And I'm going to definitely give it to a lot of a lot of men in my life. So okay, good on you, that. Thomas. All the best with your podcast, okay? Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Get the stuff out there. Okay. <laughs>